Hey y'all, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to be putting back together a 480E valve body. This is out of a 1999 unit. And so, we're gonna reassemble the valve body itself and then we'll take it to the Sonics back test machine and test all of the valve trains for sealing integrity using the Sonics back test equipment along with their test plate for the 480Es. And then from there, we'll come back to the bench assuming it passes all the tests. Uh, we'll finish up assembly and I'll also cover considerations for feed orifice sizing for your uh, 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 4 shifts. Uh, discuss separator plates in general and then we'll wrap up. So let me just real quick go over the valve trains and then I'll cover all the parts you see here on the bench. So you have your manual valve and then this is going to be your electronic pressure control solenoid, your PWM solenoid, and then your torque converter clutch regulator valve and spring. And then next to it is going to be your actuator feed limit valve and spring and your accumulator regulator valve and spring. Okay, This is going to be on the EPC side of the valve body. On the shift solenoid side you have your um, third in reverse check ball capsule along with your 3-4 upshift valve and spring. This is going to be your 2-3 shift valve and solenoid B. So here is the 2-3 valve and spring. This is going to be your solenoid A and your 1-2 shift valve and spring. And then this is going to be your primary filter screen. And then this is going to be your low and reverse check ball and capsule. Okay. There's another half of this that's actually in the valve body. So, um, and that's why I have that uh, um, straight edge there because this bench is actually a teardown bench and it's basically brand new to me. And it's sloped to the rear so that all the fluid will funnel into the trough back there and drain into the bucket. But I don't want the check ball going back there. So. Anyway, uh, we have a brand new accumulator kit for the 2.3 and the 3.4. So the kit comes with all the hardware that you're going to need, including a new um, piston pin for the 2.3 accumulator, or excuse me, the 3.4 accumulator. And then you have your 2.3 accumulator. So they call it the third clutch accumulator. So part number for these are going to be 868-3088 for the 2.3 accumulator and 2420-6749 for your um, fourth gear accumulator. Okay. They come with their own uh, sealing rings. I also have sealing rings from the main paper and rubber kit for this transmission. And in my experience, these sealing rings or you know rubber D-rings or whatever you want to call them, sometimes they're kind of hard out of the packaging. And, you know, hardened rings, I don't like that. And, you know, my fear is that they might start to leak or, you know, not, uh, you know, break up or something. But anyway, uh, this is the accumulator housing. Uh, these changed starting in 94. Uh, they did away with the torque compensator valve that was part of that whole EPC cleaning cycle that existed for the 91 through 93 4080s. Uh, they went from a Bosch EPC, which was a vented design, to the board Warner. EPC, which is non-vented. So if you're working on a 91 through 1993 model of your unit, there's going to be some adaptation that you're going to have to do if you're going to replace your EPC. And it's strongly recommended you do so because the Bosch EPCs, at least at this point, are, I mean, they're coming up here on 30 years old and they were not as reliable to begin with as the Board Warner um, force motors. And EPC, electronic pressure control solenoid, force motor, um, it, those terms all mean the same part, okay? All right, um, the spacer plate's a transgo plate. Uh, it, it is universal for all years for LADE. And just as a, you know, something to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, transgo's website, it will tell you that the plate is applicable to all years from 1991 through 2013. That's the entire 480E life cycle. However, the instructions themselves, in other words, the piece of paper that you see sitting under the plate and the gaskets, tell you that it's applicable to all years 91 through 08. All right. uh, they have not updated their instructions. I did call Transgo and confirmed with one of the techs that that's just outdated and you know, I guess they haven't gotten around to revising it yet. All right, so when it comes to 480 eval bodies, there's two areas of weakness that you have to be cognizant of and be prepared to address when you're going back together with one of these units. All right, they are the torque converter clutch regulator valve and the actuator feed limit valve. So we have a couple of valves here on the bench that 
we have ready in the event we need to install them. Now, one, I'm going to install no matter what. And it's recommended that you do that, okay? If you're installing a shift kit in one of these transmissions, uh, I believe the superior technology shift kit gives you um, an updated TCC regulator valve. I don't know if Transgo's does. I don't use Transgo shift kits for 480Es at all. Um, and the primary reason for that is I do not like their EPC relief mechanism. And then for their HD2 kit, I do not like their sandwich spacer plate. The EPC relief mechanism, while it's a great idea in theory, when it comes to the actual design of, of this particular thing, it you know it, it introduces a lot of unnecessary risk. And so, basically, in short, what it's designed to do is you know you have your EPC location right here in the valve body, and in the event there's an overpressure condition inside the transmission, it's designed to vent that into the case instead of allowing it to flow through to your applied elements. Okay, great idea, right? It's like a stopgap or a failsafe, but. The way they have you install it is they have you drill a hole right in this area here and then they install a spring-loaded mechanism with a little plunger that's intended to seal that hole that you've drilled such that when there is overpressure, the overpressure will force the mechanism up against spring tension and allow that pressure to vent. The problem is, is that every once in a while the spring or the mechanism itself will break and that will cause a massive leak at the EPC location and you will burn the transmission up. And when I say massive, it'll be subtle enough that where the thing will still be drivable, but you'll start slipping. You'll slip in forward, you'll slip in intermediate, you'll slip in, in direct, you know, in third gear until eventually you, you have no more movement, at least not in forward, maybe in reverse too. So that's why I don't ever use them. The way to address an overpressure condition in a 480E during overhaul is to just simply replace the boost valve. Okay, you install a Sonex 480E LB1, that will correct that problem because the number one cause of overpressure conditions inside 480Es and TH400s is worn boost valves and sleeves. Okay, occasionally the pressure regulator valves will be worn. Um, I have, as part of my basic rebuild series on these transmissions, um, um, a segment that walks you through testing the pump cover with all the valving in it to make sure that everything's good and it's again we're using the Sonics back test machine for that so you could check that out if you want I may extract that segment and turn it into a standalone video as well just for quick reference for people that um, don't want to watch the whole thing and you know just want information on how to test the pump cover so anyway um, that's kind of why I don't like um, shift kits in general for this transmission because I don't feel they're necessary and the Transgo kits in particular because it seems as though while they have some good ideas in theory about how to address line pressure conditions, in practice it, it just introduces unnecessary risk. All right. Um, so getting back to the areas of weakness, high mileage 480 eval bodies, uh, the TCC regular valves often worn, so we're going to just install Sonics's TCC regulator valve kit. All right, part number is 34994-01K. You can buy these individually or they come in the Sonics Sure Cure Kit or Zip Kit for um, these transmissions. Uh, like I said, the other area of weakness is the AFL valve. So what we're going to do is we have a valve from Central Valve Bodies. They're a company out of Oklahoma and they make oversized valves for various transmissions including 4L60s and 4L80s. So these are typically about a thousandth of an inch oversized. And so if your bore is typically, which in these transmissions is typical, if it's worn by about a thou, then this will kind of restore that sealing integrity that it used to have from when it left the factory. If this does not solve the problem, it's still not producing at least 15 inches of lift on the machine, then the next step beyond that is to fix it via um, boring and reaming and installing Sonics's um, oversized 480E AFL valve and spring kit. Okay, so in order to install that particular kit, you're going to have to have all the necessary tooling, including the holding fixture, the jig, uh, you know, the, the drill and the reamer, and all that stuff costs upwards of six, seven hundred bucks out the door when you, you know, you're finally all said and done. So if you're building a 4 LED for yourself, uh, you know, maybe it's your first time or you only plan on doing one or two of these, you really don't, I don't know, I mean, maybe you spend the money, but it's usually not worth it for most people. And 
an overwhelming majority of time, this will fix a worn AFL bore for you. Uh, for real high performance, I'll sometimes just proactively bore out the AFL. I mean, I'll test it just out of curiosity's sake, but you know, you, there's a lot less margin for error in a race transmission or something that's going to see serious heavy duty towing. I just go right to this and be done with it. And I have all that equipment, so. Um, but like I said, if you you're only doing this just as a project or you know to help out a friend or a family member or somebody, you know, you're probably not going to want to make that kind of uh, investment. It's, it's fairly steep. Okay, uh, let me reposition the camera and then we'll go ahead and start with the assembly. I like to save all of my solenoids for last. So what I'm going to do is just set these aside. They're literally going to be the very last things that we install onto the valve body because they're kind of delicate and they get in the way. All right, over here, this is all the stuff that is not going to be reinstalled. Now, these two pistons are in perfect shape. If you didn't want to buy the replacement uh, accumulator piston kit, you know, for whatever reason, you're just on a shoestring budget or you just, you know, you don't want to replace them. If they look like this, then there's absolutely no need to replace them. I just do it as a matter of course. That's just, you know, I guess part of my general build strategy for all four LEDs, but if, you know, like I said, you, you were on more of a shoestring budget or you were just trying to get back on the road or you're just doing a repair of the valve body, you do not need to replace the pistons if they're in good shape. If they're cracked or worn or you see obvious defects, then you obviously go ahead and, you know, buy the um, piston kit. Okay, I would strongly recommend you replace your solenoids in your harness though. Wiring harnesses are notorious for leaking at the case connector. Uh, for 4L80Es, not so much for the 4L60, but for whatever reason, for the 4L80s, they just leak. Um, maybe it has to do with the orientation of the case connector in the case, um, with the 80 relative to the 60, because the same company, Delphi, makes both harnesses or made harnesses for both transmissions, so I don't know. I don't know why one leaks and not the other, but, you know, that's, that's the deal. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and reposition the camera, and then we'll begin. All right, there's one other thing I wanted to point out and I didn't, uh, and that is the uh, Sonics 1, 2, and 2, 3 shift valve spring kit. Uh, this is another um, Sonics part that I always install on these valve bodies, and what that kit does is it recalibrates uh, the um, mechanical movement of the valves themselves as you're transitioning from 1 to 2 and from 2 to 3 for a little bit more consistency, especially at higher RPMs or under serious load. So. Alright, we're going to start with the uh, EPC side of the valve body. So I'm going to just lube up the uh, AFL and the uh, accumulator regulator valves. And then we're going to lube up the bores for the torque converter clutch regulator and the AFL and accumulator regulator so that they're ready to receive those valves. Alright, so let's take a look at the TCC regulator valve that comes from Sonics. So you have two springs in here. And they give you a spring that is designed that is designed to give you a um, factory lockup feel and a spring that's designed for more of a firm lockup feel. All right, so here are the instructions for the TCC kit. We're going to be using the longer spring that's for a firmer lockup for. Uh, heavy duty towing and hauling type applications. This is built for, um, uh, or this transmission is being built for like a towing and, and hauling and working type truck. So uh, that's how we're going to set it up. Um, if you want the OE feel, you would just use the shorter spring. All right, so for the valve itself, it comes with a scarf cut sealing ring. All right, and let me get the valve out. So here's the valve. So what you're gonna do is, you're gonna take this, this, the ceiling ring and you're gonna gently install it onto um, the groove here between the rear spool and the inboard spool. All right, just get it like that and then 
You want to take a whole bunch of green assembly lube and coat the valve, uh, you know, at the ceiling ring. Just put a fairly liberal amount on there. Okay, when this is in operation, this ceiling ring will swell a little bit and it'll completely seal off the torque converter clutch circuit there, addressing any weaknesses or any wear in the bore. So it basically renders uh, bore wear irrelevant. All right, and then we'll go ahead and coat the uh, valve itself. And then we put our spring. All right, so it's gonna go inward of the TCC solenoid. I wanna make sure I'm getting what I'm doing in the shot. All right, so what I like to do with these is I'll literally take the valve, hold it up like this, insert it into the bore. So it kind of gets in there. And then once it's started, I'll go ahead and just gently seat it. Now, you don't want to force anything. I mean, if there's um, resistance, then at that point you want to back it out. But you can start by just simply tapping on it with a screwdriver. Okay, it's almost there. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking to see if that ceiling ring is protruding a little bit. If it is, or if you're just not sure, don't be afraid to take it back out, all right? Sonics does not give you an extra uh, ceiling ring. I, I kind of wish they did, but they don't. This one's fixing to be difficult. Okay, like I said, no big deal. Just rework it a little bit. If it's gonna get hung up, it's gonna get hung up at the scarf cut junction. So a little bit more assembly lube and it should go in at that point. I'm getting green assembly lube all over the casting. I'll have to wipe that off. Don't worry about that in a second. Okay, this feels a little bit better. Okay, here we go. So then just hold it in place while you seat your roll pin. That one did drift on me there. Now we have our extra spoon, so we can just set that aside. and then just collapse the roll pin until it's completely below flush. All right, pretty simple. Okay, next is going to be our actuator feed limit valve. So you have the valve inboard and then you have the spring. Just like that. All 
There it goes. Then there's your spring. And then what you need to do is you need to find a way to compress this spring down so that you can get it past the slot here where we're going to install our little um, our little retainer. Alright, and I don't have the right screwdriver, so let me go find the right screwdriver. Should I maybe ought to use one of these chisels? Seems like every time I do one of these valve bodies, I use something different to deal with this these particular springs. Both of them require this. So here's the chisel. I'm going to try this. This works real nice. I'll let you know how wide it is. Yeah, that actually worked perfect. Okay, it's a snap-on, three-eighths of an inch chisel. Part number is PPC812A. Any three-eighths chisel will work. All right, I'm going to have to make a mental note of that for all subsequent 4080s. I've tried various size uh, round drift punches and screwdrivers and all these other different things, but that one, that one worked perfect. Accumulator regulator valve. Okay, same deal. Valve in, then spring. If you want to see it drop in. Just like that. And then for your bore plug, your little crater faces out. And then seat your roll pin. And this, you don't need really anything but your fingers. All right, now it's below flush. Okay, we have our factory TCC valve. We need to stick that over there with the rest of the parts. Our retainer clip for our PWM solenoid, and then our um, retainer bolt for the EPC and our manual valve. Manual valve goes in last too. I mean, I that thing's constantly jetting in and out. Uh, this is gonna be our little AFL uh, filter screen that goes, you know, we have a new O-ring. Let me put assembly lube on it. And we can coat the bore as well to the extent we can with this gnarly looking paintbrush. Okay, that just sits in there. All right, now I'm gonna slide over all the stuff we need for the shift solenoid side of the valve body. Put this stuff over here for the moment. So in 1995, the design for the third and reverse check ball capsule changed a little bit. Okay, the plug change, same with the uh, reverse capsule. And Sonics makes a bore plug for the 95 and up uh, third and reverse as kind of like a repair in the event you're leaking there because that's one of the test points or locations on the valve body where there can be leaks. But they don't make one for the 91 through 94 units, which kind of sucks. I don't know why but they just, they don't make one. And I talked to one of the Sonics reps and he just simply advised that it wasn't part of their product line. Yeah. Sucks it is what it is, I guess. Okay, you were 
three four shift valve is going to be inboard you have the spring and then you have the valve okay once it's in you can just take your finger and you know just kind of uh, push it in let the spring tension force the valve against your finger and do that, I don't know, a handful of times just to make sure that it's not binding, there's nothing weird going on or whatever. Um, I mean, that's really all you're looking to do when it comes to that kind of stuff. All right, let me hit this again. So all three of these O-rings, uh, the O-ring on this thing, uh, the O-ring on that filter, and then the O-ring on this filter screen are all the same, and they all come in the kit. You know, when I say the kit, I'm talking about your paper and rubber kit. All right, so this, you ideally want to be vertical. You want this going in nice and square because you don't want to have a situation where you're um, cockeyed because then that could potentially rip the O-ring. Um, I'm not going to use that drift. I'm going to use something that will actually here I'm going to use a 13 millimeter socket and this will allow me to tap it in All right. not quite in yet there we go And then just make sure that you line up your roll pin location here and you can see the roll pin wear mark. Okay, you're not gonna put the roll pin through one of these holes, you're gonna put it on, uh, you know, in, in front of the bore plug itself. So before we start installing the shift valves, let's talk about the uh, 1, 2, and the 2, 3 shift valve spring kit from Sonics. So are these mandatory? All right, that's probably the first question that is on your mind if you're not familiar with them. I would say no. Uh, I would say for most of your stock to mild performance stuff, it's not strictly speaking necessary, but it is a nice to have. And, you know, my philosophy when it comes to building transmissions in general and heavy-duty transmissions in particular is when in doubt, overbuild, okay? Yeah, it's maybe a little more expensive. Yeah, it maybe takes a little extra time. But here's the thing. You know, somebody's going to tell you, well, I'm going to only use the vehicle in, you know, certain ways and, you know, it's only going to be... Um, a cruiser or it's only going to be used to tow a small boat or... A small trailer but I mean let's face it uh, <laughs> that evolves okay that's a moving target and so you know if your uh, customers use case or yourself decide that you want to expand the scope of how you use your vehicle um, over building it to an extent will allow you to flex it into that role without having to do anything different after the fact all right, let me get the instructions for the 2-3 and the 1-2 springs from Sonics. We'll show them to you. Okay, here they are. So the longer spring, which is going to be the 2-3 shift valve spring, is going to go on the 2-3 shift valve. And you see the uh, ID grooves here on the 2-3 shift valve's outboard uh, stem. That's how you can tell the difference. All right, otherwise, if you're not paying close attention or, you know, you're distracted, 
it is easy to mix these two things up. I have done it before, uh, both the valves and the springs and the spring kit. So um, you want to make sure that you, you know, you're paying attention, I guess. Um, the one two shift valve spring is going to be one and a quarter inches and then the two three shift valve spring is going to be about yeah, 1.70, 1.69 according to this. Uh, it's hard to mix them up as long as you don't mix the valves up, okay? So here's your one two shift valve spring. I better if I just do this, okay? And then here's the two three shift valve spring. So two, three shift valve, we're gonna take the factory spring, set it aside, take the one, two shift valve spring here, take the factory spring and we'll set it aside. All right, code our valves and then just go invert it with the valve body. So you have spring inboard, then valve. So this is gonna be, again, your three, four shift valve and your third and reverse check ball capsule. So you know you're dealing with your two, three shift valve on the adjacent uh, bore there. And then your one, two. And then just take a flat blade screwdriver and gently compress each valve beyond the roll pin location. And I got lucky there because I slipped off just as I was seating that valve and got that roll pin in that location. Okay, one, two is not going to be anywhere near the amount of resistance. I mean, both of them are pretty easy to install. I'll go through with a proper roll pin punch before we go over to the vac test machine to make sure they're fully seated, but I don't know, I guess I'm being lazy right now for whatever reason. I don't feel like going to get it. All right, next is going to be our filter screen for the manual valve location. Okay, like I said, we're going to leave that manual valve out for now. That O-ring goes inboard. the best you can. Use a combination of WD and uh, assembly lube. Now if you're running a Transgo shift kit, the basic kit, um, I mean don't get me wrong, the basic kit is a good kit. Outside of that pressure relief mod. Um, they give you a boost valve in there, replacement boost valve and sleeve. Uh, they'll give you a variety of springs to recalibrate your accumulator regulator valve. Um, you know, there's, there's a decent amount of corrective parts in there for these transmissions. Um, one of the things that they provide is a different interior and exterior plug for this filter screen. What they do is they have you eliminate that O-ring in there and they have an interior plug that has its own O-ring on it. And so they have you install that. Now, the one thing that can be a little sketchy, uh, you know, at times when it comes to that particular setup is if you can't get their other outboard plug to seat because there's just not enough room in the board to get the roll pin hole and the, you know, pin lined up, they have you grind a little bit here on the end of the filter screen. I'm not crazy about that. I mean, it's plastic. I mean, I guess, yeah, sure, you can do it, but, you know, I'd rather them just make it so it works. But I get, like I said, I get why they're doing it. But my thing is, it's very rarely needed, at least in these transmissions, from my experience. Um, and then, you know, just to interject, you have your 
you have the roll pin pattern there. All right, my experience is not really needed. I mean, I've built like hundreds of these and never had one come back or have a problem because the filter screen failed in some way, shape or form or you know, the manual valve was moving around by itself. Because I think that's what they try to prevent. You know, that's the issue they try to prevent from happening with that, uh, that particular deal there. All right, last but not least is gonna be our third and reverse, excuse me, our low reverse check bowl, okay? Both of these check bowls, the low reverse and the third and reverse are the same size. So you, know, you can mix them up on the bench, it's not a big deal, as long as you don't lose one of them. That's the main thing. So here's the inboard side of the capsule there. See it? You don't need to do anything WD-40 or wise or whatever, but just uh, make sure that it's square going in, the outboard plug I'm referring to, and seat it all the way past the, the cylindrical retainer pin location. And then for all of these, they have the, um, you know, the slit facing out, facing you, at least all the ones that I've seen. As long as it's below flush, you're good to go. Okay, you're going to hear the ball moving around in there. That's normal. Okay, so we have fully assembled the um, valve body. Uh, I guess I could throw the manual valve in there. And so what we're going to do is take this thing over to the Sonics vac test machine and test all of these valve trains for sealing integrity or lack thereof. Hopefully we won't have any failed tests, but if we do, then we will, depending on which valve is uh, failing, you know, which location is failing, we'll need to either do additional repair work, buy additional repair valves or kits, um, whatever might be available, or if nothing's available, replace this valve body and that would that would kind of suck, but it's happened before and I'm sure it'll happen again. All right, we're here at the uh, Sonics back test station. So we have the machine itself, an air pump, which you're gonna need to run the machine, obviously the valve body, and then we have a few other things. So we're gonna bolt a Sonics 4LED test plate to this thing, but there's a couple um, preparatory steps we need to take before we do that. So. One of those is put either modeling clay or foam in these two locations right here. Okay, These will allow you to check the low reverse capsule and the third and reverse capsule. All right? If you don't do that, then you're not going to draw any vacuum at those locations. All right, so here is the uh, Sonics back test plate for a 4 Lady E. Hey, these are about 200 bucks, 225 shipped. Uh, I buy my stuff off eBay, but you know, anywhere transmission parts are uh, sold, more than likely they'll be able to sell these too. Now, uh, if you do have intentions on buying these, if they're in stock, like on eBay or someplace like that, um, buy them because they seem to go in and out of availability. And uh, uh, these particular ones, the 480 E test plates, have been on back order for like the last four months or so. Uh, I got the last one off of one of the uh, vendors on eBay that I frequently buy transmission stuff from and you know I haven't seen them in stock since so anyway the plate itself comes with a hardware kit and it also comes with a membrane gasket that's what Sonics calls this thing it's a membrane gasket they have you install these alignment dowels uh, that come in the kit there's two of them and they uh, go into these threaded locations as you see them Okay. Now, if you don't install these, you do run the risk of having the plate and all of the valve circuitry misaligned and your readings will not be accurate. So just thread them in and they're going to install under the membrane. 
Okay, so you're going to install them under the membrane, just like that, and then you just put the membrane on top, fully seat it, make sure it's 100% flush against the plexiglass, and uh, you know you'll have a good seal. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna bolt this, or attach it, I should say, to the valve body. And then in the hardware kit that comes, they're gonna have two through bolts with the washer and a wing nut for each. They also come with these little plugs that you can insert in these locations to further hold the membrane to the plexiglass plate. Now, I mean, that's where they go. I, to be honest with you, you don't really need to install them. But you do need to install these clamps and these clamping bolts. Because if you don't, again, you're not going to get as ideal of a seal as you would with them. So when you put the wing nuts on, it's gonna sit a little bit, you know, clunky, a little awkward, but no big deal. And while the bolts are 7 sixteenths of an inch, or that's the socket they take, you really don't need to cinch them down with a socket and a ratchet or anything like that. Hand tight is fine. Okay, the putty that you saw me use is Loctite Fun Tack. This is what Sonics uses, so that's what they recommended that uh, I use when I ask them, you know, hey, what kind of putty? Can I use Play Doh? Can I use this, that, or the other? Uh, they recommended Fun Tack, and it actually works very well. You can even reuse it. Uh, the two bits of uh, that stuff that I have in the locations that they specify, uh, I think I've reused them now four or five times. You know, four or five valve bodies worth of testing, so. Alright, uh, the last major component of these test plates kits is the instructions for each transmission. So, it's a little booklet. It'll give you information on how to set the plate up and you know, the locations for your bolts and your plugs and your alignment dowels. It'll give you some information on how to conduct testing and you know a little bit of high level um, stuff on the machine itself and you know how to align the plate. And then uh, here's where you're going to spend most of your time, and that is the clutch circuits themselves and how to test, where to test, along with all the different drivability symptom information that they give you. So, generally speaking, for all valves, stroking valves, working valves, you want to see 15 inches of lift. Like if you see, let's just say you see 14 inches of lift, that's not the end of the world. If you know, you got a valve body, it's a stock or mild application, and I don't know, I'm gonna just make this up at this point. The accumulator control valve is giving you 14 inches. That's fine, it's not the end of the world. Um, you're not gonna burn the transmission up and you know the sky's not gonna fall. If you're at eight, nine, or 10 or something like that, that's a different story. Then you're gonna to have to take corrective action. But in an ideal world, I would like to see between 15 inches and 20 inches of lift. Any more than 20, it, you do run the risk of maybe the valve dragging a little bit especially when the casting is bolted to the case and everything is working that might or might not be a little tight and again here we're talking about working valves we're not talking about o-rings or anything that's otherwise static in the valve body um, if you have a working valve and it's like 23 24 25 inches of lift then it's going to bind and so you want to just take some bench buddies and polish out that bore so that you can free up the valve a little bit and you know you'll uh, be able to run it without any issue. Okay, this is just a exploded diagram. The next page is going to give you information on doing the same test but on the pump cover, so all the valving there. As I mentioned earlier, I have a separate video on 4 LEE uh, pump cover testing. I'm not going to film the um, the rebuild or the, the pump cover testing for this transmission. It has to go out the door, but um, that's how you do it. And then, uh, you know, exploded diagram. And then the last thing that they have is a little chart to capture all your vacuum readings. Now, I don't use this particular template. I made one of my own. So this is the template that I've made up. 
All right, I like this because it'll allow me to test multiple times on all of these valves for one transmission, and then I can give this to the customer, you know, a printout of it when he or she or whomever picks up the transmission, you know. Uh, some of my customers are shops, so something like this would be a little bit maybe more orientated for them because they're, you know, again, technical, and uh, this would be more meaningful. Um, and also reassure them that... Uh, you know, I thoroughly examined the transmission 40 ways from Sunday to make sure that it was good, especially the valve body and or pump. All right, so what we're going to do is start the machine up. I'll walk you through the calibration sequence. Uh, it is critically important that you calibrate these things. Um, I do it every single time I run a test. I start with a calibration because they tend to drift on you, you know, and you know this if you have one, you know, if you use it two or three times, you then go to calibrate it, you're going to notice it's off a little bit. If it's right out of the box, it's obviously way off, so you're going to need to dial it in. All right, so from a calibration perspective, you're going to have two, you're going to have one feed, you're going to have two valves, one fitting for test, the gauge itself, calibration receptacle and then on the side of the machine there is a calibration port okay so what you're going to do is you're going to take your hose that's coming out of the test fitting and you're going to install it into the calibration receptacle here make sure it's fully seated and then when you turn the machine on you want to see a steady five inches of lift now if this is new out of the box you're not going to see that it's going to go between I don't know zero and ten okay what you're going to do is you're going to adjust your pump valve until it's reading a steady five inches of lift. And then from there, you're going to plug the calibration port on the side with a finger, and it's going to go up to between 20 and 30 inches, especially if it's new, it's going to be somewhere in that range. You're going to adjust your bleeder valve so that you can get it so it's reading a steady 25 inches. So when you take your finger off, it'll drop back down to five, put the finger back, and it will go right up to 25 again. All right, so it looks like we're sitting at about five and a half. So counterclockwise is going to raise it. Clockwise is going to lower it. Now I'm going to put a finger. All right, looks like I'm a little high, so I'm about 26 inches. So I'm going to turn it counterclockwise to lower it. And this is the bleeder valve. Okay, let it sit there for a couple seconds and then remove the finger, right back to five, reinstall the finger, back up to 25. So now we know we're good and we're ready to start testing. So then just take your hose and stick it in your test block. Okay, the test block, the hosing, the machine itself, and the little gasket is going to come in your kit when you purchase the Sonics uh, vac tester itself. Okay, it's not going to, none of this stuff's going to come with your plate kits. Everything that I just covered, you know, before we did the calibration exercise will come with the test plate. All right, so as you can see, I've wrote all of the different circuits that we're going to be testing here on the plate itself. Um, they give you, uh, you know, just ID locations, you know, 101 on A, B, C, and so forth. But that's like next to worthless, especially if you're filming this. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to know what this is or that is. So if you do run these, uh, you know, you may want to write it down just to keep track of what you're testing. All right, let's begin. All right, so we'll go and we'll start with the uh, outboard third and reverse check ball capsule. So when you're testing this and the low in reverse, you have to tilt the valve body. So you go ahead and get your test block and gasket position. And then just go ahead and tilt the valve body. All right, I'm clamping it and tilting it. I'm at 15 inches of lift. So that's going to be location 101C.
Okay, next we're going to move down. Maybe test 101B, that's the inboard side of the capsule. All right, again, you got to clamp it. You got to tilt it. And now we're at 20 and a half inches. All right, so outboard and inboard are both sealing well. Okay, the the common trouble spot is the outboard uh, plug, and Sonics makes a repair plug in the event this test bad. You know, if it fails the test, it's not sealing. Uh, they'll make that one. You know, they'll they'll make a plug for the outboard side, but it only is applicable for 95 and up. Because like I said, 94 and back, they. You know, they had a different design, and Sonics doesn't make one for that for some reason. Okay, 3-4 upshift, we're at 14.75, mm, so 14 three quarters. And that's fine. Alright, next, we're going to go and do the AFL filter screen. So when you do this, you have to plug the port for the little lubrication pipe that goes from the valve body to the back of the case to lubricate that rear case bushing. If you don't, you'll have no vacuum. So there it is plugged, 20 inches, unplugged, back to zero. And this is what I'm referring to. All right, now we'll do uh, the low and reverse check ball capsule. Sorry, just trying to get my uh, bearings here. Okay, it's holding a steady 12 inches of lift. So that's what we're going to record. And that is location 105B. Alright, 105A. All right, so this is another port we have to tilt and we have to hold and plug this location right here. Okay. Okay, right where my finger is, right here. So it looks like 23 inches, 23 and a half inches. All right, now we'll come over to the accumulator regulator valve. So we have outboard and inboard, so 110B. And I come with it this way, the bolts are interfering. Looks like 16 and a half inches of lift. You wanna press down on it? Yep, 16 and a half inches. No, it's actually 16 and a quarter. And that's 110B. Now 
All right, now we'll do 110A. Okay, now and that's giving us 17. All right, now we'll do the TCC regulator valve inboard. It looks like 23 and a half inches. And that's going to be 108A. And then outboard. And that looks like 19 and a half. All right, now I'm going to move to the shift valve side. We'll start with the 2-3 shift valve outboard and inboard. So we'll do inboard first, 102A. It's like 19 and a half inches. Now 102B, outboard. It's like uh, 16 and a half. All right, we'll do uh, inboard for the one two shift valve. It's gonna be 103A. Okay, looks like 21. May have to polish that board a little bit. And then that's inboard. This is outboard, 103B. 16 and a half. I don't think I tested the actuator feed limit, or if I did, I didn't record it, so let me go back. Actuator feed limit looks good. No, I did not test it. 18, 18 and a quarter. And 18 and a half. I'm going to record 18 and a half. Okay, so this valve body is healthy. gasket doesn't want to come off the plate. To hear the results. So if this plug was no good, we, you know, Sonics makes a uh, end plug there, but like I said, it's for 95 and up only. They don't make one for the 91, 92, 93, 94 valve bodies, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we don't need to go there. It, it, this one's fine as is. All right, so that is uh, vacuum testing on a 4 liter eval body using this test plate. If you don't have the test plate, you can still test the valve body with just the machine and the little test block and gasket. It's just a, a little bit trickier. You may have to use more, you know, uh, putty or whatever to seal off the, the different circuits that otherwise would be sealed by the plate. But if you do a lot of these, especially for LEDs, um, I, you know, this is, and I don't want to say it's a must have, but it is a very worthwhile investment. So, all right, let's go back to the bench. We'll uh, finish up the assembly and be done. All right, so the uh, vacuum testing was successful. We don't have to do anything beyond what we've already done with that valve. I just, that's always good to know. And, uh, you know, it's a great result to have. So now what I want to do is put together our um, 2, 3, and 3, 4 accumulators. So as far as the putty is concerned, um, you know, most of the time that putty will clean up very quickly. But if it doesn't, I just go ahead and use like a straight razor to mop up whatever is left. I mean, it's usually pretty um, cooperative, but sometimes, you know, it gets stuck in there. And if it's deep in the crevice, you just take a small 
thin flat blade screwdriver and that usually also takes care of it. All right, uh, the valve body back here for a minute. All right, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes these ceiling rings or you know rubber rubber seals are kind of hardened. And while I know you can't feel anything through the camera, um, these feel hard to me. Okay, these are out of the kit. Brand new as well, I mean, they got a little WD-40 on them, but brand new otherwise. I'm actually gonna run those. These are, yeah, they just feel odd. So you're gonna have your pin, your new E-clip, and then of course, your pistons. All right, just simply install your, your O-rings. Carefully work them in the groove. The main thing is you don't wanna have these things twist on you. And this top one will fight you. And I mean, I have a whole little bin full of these things, but if, uh, you know, you don't, you just want to be extra special careful because they do want to kind of roll on you like you see this one. And, you know, you're just going to have to monkey with it until it cooperates. All right, grab the housing. Whole bunch of assembly lube in the bores. And then lube up your, your O-rings. And if you know, they look a little weird, just double check them. Okay, the uh, rounded side has to face out. And like I said, they will twist up on you if you let them. So this is gonna be your two, three. Goes in just like that. And then for your three, four, the flat side will face inboard. Okay, these pins, the design changed on them, I think in 95, maybe 96, somewhere in there. Uh, they will retro back to any year for a lady. So your big spring is here and your shorter spring is here. Okay, um, while I would never suggest you do it, if you do run the HD2 shift kit from Transgo, they give you a different spring for the 2-3 to affect a little bit quicker shift. You can also cut the coils on the stock one to accomplish the same thing. Like I said, it's, those kits are not worth um, you know, they're not worth the money, in my humble opinion. All right, let's talk about the spacer plate. So this is Transgo's um, 
4L 80E 48PLT01, so 48 plate 01. So you notice here it says, I mean, in addition to that stuff, don't worry, this plate fits all 91 through 08. What I really should say is, don't worry, this plate fits all 91 through 2013. So they have to update their instructions. All right, so here is the back. Transgo has their own reamer and uh, you know jig kits for repairing valves, you know, valve bores or reconditioning them. So um, Transgo's are, I think, I mean, I don't know how much they are, but I know they're markedly cheaper than the Sonics um, tooling. So you may opt for a Transgo's and as it says here, um, one package or you know one box will fit six valve bodies fix not fit i mean i guess technically it'll fit them too but they'll repair six valve bodies okay here's a little bit of information about the um early 91 and 92 or 90 yeah 91 92 uh, force motors um they went away from these and then uh you know they have you drill a, a vent hole or a balance hole so that uh, you can use those uh, updated ones, the board warners, in the uh, 91, 92 valve bodies. All right, I want to talk about the uh, hole sizes real quick, give you some, I guess, tips and pointers for drilling out your feed orifices. I will say straight away, if you're running a purely stock application with a factory level converter, you can just install this plate as it is out of the packaging and be perfectly fine. Okay, the 4L80Es do not require much in the way of orifice resizing to affect firmer, quicker shifts. And it's a lot easier to go overboard than it is to dial it into where it's, you know, pleasant to drive, it's shifting crisply and firmly when it needs to, but not harsh and not bang shifting at part throttle okay um, that 4L80E basic rebuild series I have on the channel that covers the 94 4L80 that was featured uh, that came in and it was bang shifting and that had the factory plate we put a transgo plate in it but um, when we took it apart and if you watch the teardown video you, you would have seen this somebody drilled out the one two feed uh, to 70 thousandths of an inch okay now those early 4L80Es, they have a lot of clearance in the intermediate clutch for whatever reason. Uh, and I think that had like 65,000, 70,000 worth of clearance, something like that. And between the increased orifice size and the, uh, um, you know, the excessive clearance, uh, it was shifting like, you know, uh, I think the customer told me it was like back breaking. So, you know, that's something to be mindful of. And if you drive it like that, especially on the one, two, you leave, the one-way uh, roller assembly for the intermediate very vulnerable especially in those early units 97 and up they installed the um, heavy-duty board Warner 34 element um, intermediate sprags uh, and they, they revised the drum a little bit updated with bonded pistons but in the earlier units they had like a 16 element uh, sprag and um, they were a little more vulnerable especially to things like this so uh, you want to be mindful of that now we're gonna dual feed this transmission, so I'm drilling the 2.3 out to 85 thousandths. Okay, this is gonna assume a stock to about 2200 stall converter. All right, the reason why we wanna go a little bit more aggressive on the uh, the 2.3 shift on a dual feed situation is because when you dual feed the direct clutch internally in these transmissions, you're basically providing access to the entire underside of that piston, which I want to say more than doubles the volume in that applied chamber for your direct clutch. So it acts like a second 2-3 accumulator. So if you don't drill this feed hole out and you do internally dual feed, you're going to see a very, very soft 2-3 shift. And in under very hot, uh, heavy throttle or wide open throttle um, situations, it may, uh, it may actually hang or flare a little bit. And you don't want that, right? Because that leaves the direct clutch vulnerable and it's the most vulnerable clutch as it is in these transmissions. You don't want to even leave it more exposed. So 
if you're dual feeding, 80 to 90 thousandths, and I just typically go right in the middle. Now, if you're running a higher stall converter, you wanna be in the 90s. And depending on how high of a converter stall you're running, um, you know, you may be over a hundred thousandths with your feed hole size in a dual feed situation, like a full race, four thousand and up, you know, a hundred thousandths, hundred and ten thousandths even is fine. Again, if you're way up in there, four or five thousand, but at that point, you're probably running a trans brake and, you know, or full, um, reverse pattern, manual valve body, something like that. You're not driving on the street, um, you know, commuting to work and back with a four thousand stall or higher converter. I mean, I guess you could, but it wouldn't be uh, all that enjoyable. Um, your 3-4 uh, is also a, um, a clutch that typically has <clears throat> a lot of clearance, so 50 to 60 thousandths, and it will also hit hard if you drill this out too aggressively with a stock stall converter, especially in a passenger car. A real heavy truck, like an RV or something, that's fine. Uh, four ladies and box trucks or, you know, very heavy type vehicles or commercial vehicles. You'll see different calibration and you'll wanna open your feed holes up a little bit more than a typical passenger car light duty application. When I say light duty, I'm talking about your, you know, one ton trucks and, and below. So. You don't need a lot of orifice resizing here to get quicker, firmer shifts. And that's why I always tell people, you don't need to run shift kits with the TH400s, 4 LEDs. In fact, most GM transmissions, you really don't need it. 700R4 to my, you know, all the stuff I work on is really the only exception. And that's because they give you that, uh, and here I'm referring to Transgo, they give you the updated throttle boost valve that's redesigned with additional lands and grooves so that it doesn't get stuck like the factory valve will sometimes do. But it's, you know, shift kits, uh, you know, um, stuff like uh, Transgo or Superior Tech or whatever. I mean, they're really not necessary. Um, you can buy individual valves from Sonics or Transgo. Uh, you can recalibrate your shifting mechanically just simply by drilling holes. And that is it. All right. Okay, the gaskets that come in the kits, they're going to be first design gaskets only. Okay, the aftermarket kits from Transstar or TransTech or whomever you're getting your gaskets from, okay, they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be first design because the first design will have provisions for the uh, large feed pipe that goes, you know, one end to the other in the uh, 91 through 96 4 LADEs. In the second design, you know, the second generation uh, center lube transmissions, that feed pipe was eliminated and a smaller feed pipe was added instead at the rear of the valve body. And that's what you saw earlier um, get plugged by my finger so we can test that um, AFL filter screen thing. All right, I'm going to put a little bit of assembly lube here so we can begin the. Uh, you know, final assembly of this valve body. All right. So first things first, go ahead, put your gasket. And then your plate. And then because this is going to be applicable to first and second generation, you're going to have your bowl hole location here and your feed pipe location for the large feed pipe on those earlier four LEDs. Okay, it does not exist for the 97 and up. All right, um, let's see if I can show it to you real quick. So we have, we have the um, first design ports for that feed pipe, but you notice the casting itself kind of terminates about a third of the way through those uh, two hole locations. All right, you have Z-bolts right here, okay, right by my two fingers. These align the valve body, the spacer plate, and accumulator body. So one thing you want to do is take a couple of bolts and stick them in there so that you preserve your alignment. And you can use whatever bolts, doesn't matter. So, 
couple of uh, other valve body bolts are perfectly fine. That makes sure that everything is going to be aligned when this thing goes back onto the case. You won't have any problems trying to fit uh, bolts through these bolt hole locations. Okay, now go ahead and put your gasket for your accumulator body. Upside down and backwards. You know, it wouldn't be a wouldn't be a Nix transmission video if we didn't install something upside down or backwards. Okay, 97 inch pounds on all these bolts. Okay, just apply a little bit of downward pressure so that you can install all of them. You want to get them all threaded in part way before you zip them down. And then you still want to put a little bit of downward pressure even when you're going at it with the impact because there's a small risk that you know, something might happen and the threads might actually, you know, strip out on the valve body side. And we don't want that. All right, eight millimeter. All right, one thing I like to do is just make sure that I'm good and it looks like I'm not over here. So this bolt's a little tight, it's getting hung up. And you can even take your bolts and just go through and check all the rest of them. Okay, as long as you're able to move your bolt through the Z-bolt locations, I mean, if it grabs a little bit, no big deal, but when we first cinched these down, the thing was getting hung up, it was basically seized. So no torque sequence, though generally speaking, I will start with this bolt, then these bolts, then this one, then this one, then this one, or some, some similar arrangement like that. So 97. I mean, I also like to work up a little bit. This is optional. You know, you don't have to torque these in multiple stages. You can go right to torque if you want. I just prefer to work up. It's just a habit, nothing more. All right, now we can go to torque. Hit 
this one first. So that does it for the assembly as far as all the castings. So the last thing that we really need to do is install our solenoids. So here's our PWM solenoid, force motor slash electronic pressure control solenoid, and our two shift solenoids A and B. Okay, these are all OEM. Borg Warner uh, was the manufacturer of the force motors from 1993 through 2003. And then um, this, is, this is Rostra, perfectly fine. And these are OEM, but they're not in OEM packaging. All right, before we install these, I want to get my multimeter over here and we'll test them to make sure that they're at least, you know, they're at least functioning from a continuity perspective so that we don't put a bad solenoid on and let it go out the door like that. I'll be honest, it's pretty rare solenoids are bad out of the box. Um, I have a couple builder friends, they say they see a lot of EPCs bad, but um, I personally haven't seen it, though it doesn't mean that, you know, what they say is any less credible. They do a lot more transmissions than I do. So, all right. We did not need this uh, oversized valve, thankfully. <clears throat> all right, let me go get the multimeter and then we'll test them out. All right, I may have to change camera angles again because I don't know if this is going to be visible to you. Let's see. Nope. Nope. All right, that's a little better. Okay, just so set your DVOM to ohms. All right, PWM. Eleven point three. We want to see between ten and thirteen ohms on the pulse width modulated torque converter clutch solenoid. For the shift solenoids, between twenty and twenty-four is considered good. Twenty-three-three, and then for the force motor, between four and six is considered normal. It's like five point three. If you move your uh, leads even ever so subtly, it'll it'll change the continuity rating a little bit. No big deal, just FYI. All right, get that out of the way. This manual valve out of the way. That's literally the last thing we'll do and then we'll call this thing done. All right, 
assembly is a little bit awkward now. Let me see if I can get something under there. a little better. Okay, for your force motor, you want the connectors facing out. And that's how the harness is going to be routed. And it seems a little odd, but that's how it's done. And then the connector for the PWM solenoid is going to face in the opposite direction. Okay, 97 inch pounds on these little, I'm sorry, no, these take 71 inch pounds. 71 inch pounds, not 97. Torx 27 on these. Lube up your O-rings on your TCC solenoid. Double check the bore, see if you can get some assembly lube in the bore as well. Okay, everything looks good in there. And just press it home, turn it, and then reinstall your little retainer. You may have to push and pull on this just a little bit to get that clip to seat. No biggie. Okay, so this is your AFL valve and this is your accumulator regulator valve. So now we come to the shift solenoid side. Do up the O-rings. So this is going to be shift solenoid B and shift solenoid A. So I'm way off. So you get on 97, we gotta take it down to 71. All right, just make sure you're fully seated your Torx 27 socket into the fastener. And then just go right to torque. Like I said, the assembly is a little awkward. I mean, I suppose you can install these before you do the accumulator body if you wanted to, but I don't know. I'm overly paranoid about breaking or damaging the solenoids, so I do them last. Or I guess second to last, the manual valves last. That didn't need a whole lot. All right, that's the valve body fully assembled. 
So, to summarize, uh, we installed some corrective parts, had a clean casting, um, installed all new uh, accumulator pistons and a new, um, you know, a new guide pin for the 2.3. We tested this valve body comprehensively on the Sonics back test machine. Everything passed. Everything looks good. And then we finished assembly. We drilled our spacer plate out for a heavy duty application with a stock stall converter. And uh, we installed the transgo plate. So all is well. All new solenoids. When this goes back on, it should function um, as it should. All right. As always, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, thoughts, go ahead and leave them in the comments section. Um, if there's something else you'd like me to cover about 4L80Es, um, let me know as well so I can do what I can to prioritize it. Otherwise, as always, thank you so much for watching. I do greatly appreciate your time. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. But until then, enjoy the rest of your day or your evening.